Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is uh, Joshua Tucker. I'm the, co I'm the director of the Jordan Center for the Advanced Study of Russia and one of the co-conveners of today's uh, New York City Russia Public Policy Series seminar, along with uh, Alex Cooley, the director of the Harriman Institute at Columbia. Uh, for those of you who are new to these uh, events, we have been running them now for a number of years now, and that we call this our Russia, New York City Russia Public Policy Series. And what we try to do in these events is we try to uh, deal with big picture questions and big topics in the study involving Russia's policy, contemporary policy towards Russia, Russian foreign policy, Russian policy within Russia. Um, and we try to bring together people with diversity of opinions from across academia and policymakers as well. It is an incredible pleasure today that we were able to get um, folks who were involved in both sides of the discussion of the uh, letters that appeared on Politico earlier this year about rethinking and re-rethinking US-Russian uh, policy. So uh, I just wanted to welcome everybody here. We'll have more events going on this, uh, this semester. Um, in the New York City Russia Public Policy Series. We hope to see many of you there as well, but I'm gonna pass it over to Alex so we can get into the meat of the discussion to introduce our, uh, our panelists today. So Alex. Perfect, thanks Josh. Uh, and again, welcome everyone. In the interest of time, uh, I'm not gonna read the full bios of all the panelists, rather I will offer some brief introductions in the order in which they are speaking. The way we've um, conceived of the panel today is that we have um, two signers of the original letter, um, it is time um, for the US to rethink its policy, and then two from the other side. And I'll just mention the original Politico letter that was published in August um, was authored uh, in, by uh, uh, Rose Godmuller, uh, Tom Graham, Fiona Hill, uh, Bob Legvold, John Huntsman, and Tom Pickering, and David Kramer uh, was the author of um, the response to that. Um, so um, the format for today is that we have asked our panelists to address the following question. Uh, what do you think is or are the most important issues in US relations moving forward? And how do the perspectives advanced in the two political letters differ in terms of how they would approach these issues? There's a lot potentially on the table um, from Syria to arms control, to human rights, uh, to political interference. So let's go ahead and get to it. So uh, opening uh, our uh, panel off is uh, Ambassador Rose Godmuller, who is the Frank E. and Arthur W. Payne Distinguished Lecturer at Stanford University's Freeman Spolia Institute for in International Studies and its Center for International Security and Cooperation. Um, Godmuller was the Deputy Secretary General of NATO from 2016, 2019, where she helped to drive forward NATO's ad adaptation and new security challenges in Europe and in the fight against terrorism. Prior, um, she uh, also served as the Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security at the US Department of State. Um, uh, extensive experience uh, also in negotiating the New START Treaty and uh, pertinent to the series, she was also a senior associate with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace with joint appointments to the Nonproliferation and Russia program. Um, Ambassador, welcome. Um, you uh, were one of the original signers of the letter. Now it's time uh, to rethink our Russia policy. And so we look forward to your comments. Thank you very much, Alex. And thank you to Josh. It's a super pleasure to be here today. And uh, also with my colleagues, uh, Tom Graham, of course, but also David Kramer and Elmo, Evelyn Farkas. I think uh, this is an opportunity for a great, uh, great debate today. You know, I wanted to make three quick points to get us started. The first is that I think the editors of Politico did us all a disservice with their choice of a headline for the response letter from David, Evelyn, and others. The headline read, no, now is not the time for another Russia reset. The subtext emphasizes that Washington should avoid pointless dialogue and instead push back firmly against Vladimir Putin's aggression. I think both sides in today's debate can affirm that neither of us is interested in pointless dialogue and that we must push back firmly against Putin's aggression. My second point is to your question, Josh and Alex, uh, what do I think uh, are the most important issues in the US-Russian relations moving forward? And how are there different perspectives represented in the letters? I would say the following. I have always believed that nuclear conflagration represents an existential threat to the United States. And therefore, we must continue to counter that threat in any way that we can. 
we don't negotiate arms control treaties with the Russians because they are behaving well, but because we must prevent nuclear war. Believe me, I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis, and even though I was only in the fourth grade, I don't want to go through that again. I, by the way, I did want to parenthetically praise this new book by historian Martin Sherman, Gambling with Mar uh, Armageddon. Uh, it was reviewed in the New Yorker October 12th. If you have now, ha haven't had a chance to get the book yet, I would urge you just to read the review. It's a, a very good, I think, uh, relook at that history. In our letter, we argue that there are other existential threats, climate change, global extremism, and terrorism that we must fight in the same way, working with Russia. The final point I'd make today is how we differ in our approach. I'm not sure we do differ in our approach, so I'm looking forward to our discussion this morning to see. We uh, feel strongly that diplomacy is not a reward for good behavior, but a necessary tool in our national toolbox for addressing the threats that confront us. As our military leaders like to say, if the diplomats fail, then we have to buy more bullets. Military tools cannot be the only thing in our toolbox. For a number of reasons, diplomacy Russia has suffered in the last years. Trump's assault on the State Department, the closure and downsizing of the embassy and consulates in response to Salisbury and other Russian depredations, and Russia refusing to engage as they do refuse to engage today in the NATO Russia Council. But I believe, and I believe my uh, co-authors uh, also would underscore that we must do our best to restore it. We need to deliver tough messages to Russia to make sure they know our red lines. And for that, we need to communicate via diplomacy. So thank you again. Those are my, that's my opening salvo. And I look forward to what my colleagues have to say. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Tom Graham. He is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he focuses on Russian Eurasian affairs and US-Russian relations. He has served as special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia on the US National Security Council uh, from 2004 to 2007, also director for Russian affairs 2002 to 2004. Uh, and someone who uh, is very much in the midst of fostering understanding between the Russian and the US positions in both the policy world and in academia. Tom, welcome. Thank you very much, Alex, uh, and thank you, Josh, as well, for hosting this uh, series. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with Rose, one of my co-authors, and also with David and Evelyn. Uh, David and I have actually debated this issue uh, quite frequently over the past few years. Um, I think I know what he's going to say. I think he knows what I'm going to say, but they're always surprises. Um, and so we'll try to keep it lively today as well. Uh, so let me begin by saying that there are two propositions that all four of us, I believe, would subscribe to. Uh, first is that U.S.-Russian relations are the worst they have been since the last years of the Cold War. And second, that current U.S.-Russia policy lacks coherence and direction. So we need a new policy for a dangerous situation. And that is where the differences arise. In broad terms, I would say there are two possible approaches which are represented by our letters. We might call them the normative approach and the pragmatic approach. As the terms imply, values lie at the center of the normative approach, outcomes at the center of the pragmatic one. The normatives deal in absolutes. A country is a good actor or a bad actor. Pragmatists, on the other hand, deal in shades of gray. No one country has a monopoly on morality as it pursues its national interest. Pragmatists do not seek ideal solutions. Rather, they ask what is possible given the circumstances surrounding a particular issue. They settle for good enough resolutions to diffuse dangerous situations while keeping open the possibility for future advance. Normatists seek moral clarity and total victory. Pragmatists settle for incremental progress amidst ambiguity. So with regard to Russia today, the normatists see the archetype of a bad actor, an implacably hostile, aggressive, and immoral regime with which it makes no sense to negotiate because Moscow habitually operates in bad faith. In their view, nothing will change as long as Putin remains in power. In these circumstances, the normatists call for ever harsher punishment in the belief that Russia will ultimately capitulate to American demands. They downplay Russia's capacity to do us and our allies harm if pressed to the extreme. 
they, nor I would argue Moscow sophisticated cyber weapons that it could turn against our critical infrastructure. And they undervalue its nuclear weapons uh, that could be deployed in local crisis and experiments. Now, pragmatists, by contrast, see a Russia that will defend its vital interests as it defines them with all the means at its disposal. We have no illusions about the character of the Russian regime, but we, but the, uh, we do believe that the challenge we face is of such urgency that we cannot afford to wait for a better Russia to emerge. Pragmatists think it is possible to conclude beneficial agreements with Putin's Russia as long as adequate verification and monitoring procedures are put in place so that we can withdraw in good time with little damage to our interests should Moscow cheat. Pragmatists finally believe that through a combination of firmness and flexibility, we can diffuse or even change or, over time Russian conduct that threatens our interests and values. Now, I think we'll find out that normatists and pragmatists can agree on certain policies. Both uh, see value, for example, in rebuilding ties with our allies in Europe and Asia and maintaining a credible deterrent posture, especially along the NATO-Russia frontier. Where they differ most dramatically is in their attitude towards sanctions and diplomacy. And this came out, I think, in the two letters. Normatists press sanctions, including congressionally mandated ones, as effective punitive measures. They tend to scorn diplomacy. Pragmatists, by contrast, while not rejecting sanctions, believe they can be effective only when coupled with diplomatic engagement. In particular, they see value in targeted sanctions that can be eased as appropriate in a negotiating process in exchange for Russian steps that advance American goals. Diplomacy for pragmatists, as Rose has already said, is not a reward for good behavior, but a tool for protecting and advancing our interests. It helps us understand better what motivates the other side so that we can craft a more effective policy, and it provides a means to send clear signals to Moscow about our goals, expectations, and red lines. Now, the two policy approaches I have just described have interacted throughout American history to produce a unique American style in foreign policy. Norman of Rhetoric has inspired many around the globe and advanced democratic practices. I think that's undeniable. Pragmatic action has helped ensure stability and peace. And we were repeatedly accused of hypocrisy when our pragmatic actions appear to belie our normative rhetoric. During the Cold War, it is fair to say, pragmatism set the course for American policy towards the Soviet Union behind a veil of ideologically charged moralistic rhetoric. Even Ronald Reagan, perhaps the most normative Cold War president, saw value in negotiations, and his Secretary of State, George Shultz, enthusiastically engaged in problem solving with his Soviet counterparts. In the post-Soviet period, initial pragmatism by each administration was ultimately overwhelmed by normative goals. Uh, and that, I think, has been the story up until Trump's administration, uh, which is neither normative nor pragmatic in its approach and something of a unique phenomena in American history. Now, to be sure, Russian contact has been a major driver of deterioration in relations, and Putin has relentlessly challenged American interests. I think there's no disagreement among us on that. I would simply argue that we have exacerbated the situation by transforming what under any circumstances would have been a tough competition between opposing sets of national interests into a struggle uh, that is in many ways between good and evil. And that has precluded us from finding a better and safer place to advance our, both our interests and our values as we move forward. Now for me, and I don't wanna speak for Rose, the open letter was a plea to return to pragmatism such an approach enjoyed wide bipartisan support and advanced our interests without irreparably compromising our values in the middle and late stages of the Cold War. And it did that while confronting a rival that was much more dangerous across all dimensions than Putin's Russia. And so I think, and this will be my final point, that pragmatism will serve us well today. We just need to give it a chance. So let me end there, Alex. Thanks so much, Tom. And now we move um, to David Kramer, who joined Florida International University's 
uh, School of International Public Affairs as a senior uh, fellow, rather, in the Václav Havel Program for Human Rights and Diplomacy in May 2017. And he's also a director for European and Eurasian Studies. So he's now firmly uh, on team academia. Welcome, David. Previously, he served for four years as president of Freedom House, um, as well as eight years in the U.S. Department of State during the administration of President George W. Bush, including as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, and Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, where he was responsible for the Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, and Belarus uh, portfolio. Uh, David, uh, welcome. Uh, you are the author behind uh, the uh, uh, Politico letter, uh, the response uh, that was labeled as now is not the time of a reset. And also, I think we'd be curious to hear whether that was your choice uh, of title. And if not, what was your title to that letter? But welcome. Alex, thanks very much. Thanks to you and Josh for, for hosting us. And it's great to uh, be back with Tom. Uh, as he said, we have debated this issue a few times and uh, also to be joined by Rose and Evelyn, who also has joined me on a few debates occasionally. Um, and let me let me start by saying first I didn't pick the, the headline uh, for our response, uh, which had a number of other uh, contributors to it. Um, that is something that often is done, as, as I think we all know, by the editors at, at these outlets themselves. I I want to pick up on the part of the open letter that says we must deal with Russia as it is, not as we wish it to be totally fully utilizing our strengths, but open to diplomacy. And, and here I, I would say that there, I, I hope is agreement between the so-called pragmatists and the normative camp. Um, but I would argue that it actually is not gray. It's pretty black and white. And let me quickly run down through the, the list. It, it, the Putin regime is a regime that came to power under a terrible cloud in 1999, the four bombings that killed nearly 300 people. It's a regime that invades its neighbors. It's propping up Alexander Lukashenko in Belarus. Uh, it props up the murderous Assad regime in Syria and commits war crimes and crimes against humanity against Syrian civilians there. It's supporting the Maduro regime in Venezuela. It reportedly has placed bounties on American soldiers' heads in Afghanistan, interferes in our elections and stirs up social and political tensions. It uses banned and radioactive uh, chemical agents, uh, weapons of mass destruction, if you will, against its critics inside Russia and beyond Russia's borders, abuses the human rights of its own citizens and kills, jails, and harasses Russian critics, opponents of the regime, journalists, human rights activists, historians, provides support to one of the most brutal local leaders uh, of, uh, in, inside Russia, and that's Ramzan Kadyrov, arrests Americans on spurious charges, rigs elections in its own country and nationwide votes, violates arms co control agreements, and dangerously buzzes our aircraft and, and, and ships and violates the territorial integrity of another of a number of NATO member states. And my question, I guess, would be to Tom and Rose is, if you find this behavior unacceptable, what would you do about it? And it seems that the, one of the recommendations is to sit down and talk about it. I, I'm not sure what the point of those discussions would be other than talking about arms control. And I think Evelyn and I, I don't want to speak for Evelyn, but I think Evelyn and I would agree that that is an issue where our two sides should sit down. And in fact, we are sitting down uh, at, at, at this present day, sitting down and trying to renew the New START Treaty. Um, we haven't suffered from a lack of talking with Russia. We have ongoing discussions right now in the Minsk group about Armenia and Azerbaijan. We have had efforts by the Bush administration, in which Tom and I both served, through the strategic dialogue to run through a list of issues. We did have the reset policy under President Obama with President Medvedev. Uh, and, and each of these, um, leaving aside the Minsk group discussions about Armenia and Azerbaijan, but each of these has led to nowhere. And President Trump has even tried his own personal diplomacy and look where we are. I would agree with Tom that US-Russian relations are at their low point. The bottom line, I think, and the reason these efforts have failed is because Putin holds us up as the enemy. He is more interested in portraying the United States as Russia's greatest threat to justify his repressive control at home than he is in improving bilateral relations with the United States. We're responsible in Putin's arguments 
uh, for the protests inside Russia going back to 2011 and 12, or the revolutionary movements in Ukraine and Georgia, and even the protests in Belarus, the Kyrgyzstan movement today. We, the US, NATO, and the EU are the biggest threats that Russia faces. And yet, only 3% of Russians, according to a recent Levada Center poll, consider the United States to be an enemy. So this is where I'm not sure when the authors of the open letter argue that Putin represents the country's interest, whether he in fact is truly reflecting uh, the, the sentiment inside Russia. So what, would, what should we do? And I'll, I'll end with this. I'll run through these quickly and then turn to Evelyn. Um, we, I, I would offer seven, if you will, stop signs. We should stop ignoring the threat the Putin regime poses. We should stop wanting better relations with Moscow than Putin wants with us. We should stop conflating the Russian regime with Russia writ large or the Russian people. We should stop downplaying our principles and our values. We should stop talking about removing sanctions unless and until Putin completely withdraws all his forces from Ukraine, including Crimea. We should stop enabling Russian corruption and we should stop selling out Russia's neighbors, for example, saying no NATO for Ukraine and Georgia without asking the people of those countries what it is they would like to do. And, and, and the last thing I'll say, and it's the one go sign I would offer, um, and that is, yes, we should talk with Russia about arms control, and trying to renew the New START Treaty. I think there, at least, we can find some, some common ground. Thanks a lot. David, thank you so much. So uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Dr. Evelyn Farkas and who is currently president of Farkas Global Strategies. Um, prior to that, she was a senior fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the US and at the Atlantic Council, also a national security con contributor for NBC and MSNBC. She served from 2012 to 2015 as deputy assistant of secretary of defense for Russia, Ukraine, Eurasia, uh, Balkans, Caucasus, and conventional arms control. And from 2010 to 2012, she was senior advisor to the Supreme Allied Commander Europe and special advisor to the Secretary of Defense uh, for the NATO summit. Um, Evelyn, welcome. And you were one of um, the signers of the response letter uh, that David author, and you bring in also a wealth of experience on these security and defense uh, issues. I think we'd be uh, interested in, in your response to the conversation and perspective about the pressing issues facing the relationship. Sure, sure, Alex. So thank you to you and Josh for the invitation. Um, it's always a great opportunity to work again with Rose, my colleague from the Obama administration, my superior, um, and then also obviously with David, um, who has been a co-collaborator, co including with Tom um, on opposite sides um, in other debates. So um, it's, it's a great chance to have a good discussion. It is true that fundamentally we are in agreement um, about the problem, although I will say, um, and I should also add to my bio, um, since you're in New York, that I did, I, this past cycle, I ran for Congress um, in New York's 17th Congressional District. And notably for this conversation, the Russians did interfere in my election. You can Google it, Google my name with Julian Barnes, and you will see it was a very mild um, interference, probably just intended to let me know that they were watching, but nonetheless, they did manage to interfere um, in a public fashion. Google Yonkers Tribune, um, you'll see a screed against me there. Um, by one of their operatives. Um, I think um, you asked this question, Alex, about sort of what's the big issue in the relationship between the United States and Russia right now. And I would say the biggest issue is Russia's challenge to democracy and to our international system, our international institutions and the rule of law. And I won't get into that. Uh, I think David did a good job uh, basically, you know, running down the litany of abuses that Russia has um, committed against democracy and international order. Um, but I think that is the framework within which I see Russia. And um, I wanted to just make two points on the approach of the original article, three points on tactics and tools, and then just a quick thing about the normative pragmatic, pragmatist thing. Um, so the original writers talked about um, the need for diplomacy and the need to use all the tools in the US government arsenal or toolbox. <laughs> um, arsenal is not the right word. Um, and I would say that we definitely agree that we also need to use diplomacy, as David said. And we also believe we need to leave the window open for opportunities to collaborate with Russia 
on the most urgent existential issues like climate change, arms control, um, pandemics. Um, the, I think where we differ slightly is at least in the article they wrote, they prioritized sort of, they talked about the broader international risks um, created by the Russia challenge, whereas, and, and, and they called it a challenge, whereas I think David and I would agree that it's more of a threat that Russia poses and it's an immediate one. And so therefore we, we actually put that in an area where it's more urgent um, or it's certainly as urgent as dealing with climate change cooperatively with Russia. Um, then on the tactics, um, they talk about diplomacy being episodic um, and that's insufficient. But when Rose and I were in government, our diplomacy was more or less steady, I would argue, um, and sustained, but we didn't achieve what we wanted to with the Russians. So I think it gets to what David was saying and maybe the question of what do the authors of the first letter mean when they talk about the, the desire for detente? What is detente? Um, what is, there? they use also this term, acceptable resolution. What would that look like? Because for, for the, the respondents, for, for us reading the letter, we felt like there maybe wasn't enough emphasis on the fact that we don't want to compromise, it's true, on core values, because those involve sovereignty, borders, things that are, again, the, the, the foundation of the international system, international law and order, which are very important to the United States and our allies. So we just, I think, I, I don't want to speak for David, but certainly I had trouble understanding what the first writers were proposing, practically speaking. <laughs> and, and I would go further to say, when the authors of the first letter kind of criticized us when they came back with their rebuttal, they said, well, our pressure won't result in anything. Whereas I think what we were trying to say is the pressure that we believe in, that is to say the Kramer group, if I can call us that, um, we were calling for a sustained pressure on Russia, economic, military, although through deterrence, um, political, in order to make a fruitful dialogue more likely. So our view is that you need both. And I guess that gets me to my response to this distinction that Tom put out of normative versus pragmatic. He said it himself when he said even Reagan was, who was a normative guy, was pragmatic. I don't think you can separate the two. It's impossible. I think your norms guide you to your objectives and you work as a pragmatist to achieve them. Do you compromise? Not on your values. Do you compromise along the way in order to get what you want ultimately? Sure. So I think, and all of us have been in government, we know what that means really intuitively in our gut. So I think to draw that distinction, it's an artificial kind of academic distinction. You need to balance risks all the time. Um, we know that we're all doing it every day ourselves now. Um, and so I think it's really a question of how do we use all of the tools that we have in our, in our you know, United States toolbox effectively in order to create the likelihood that maybe Russia will be more cooperative or just to see us through with minimal risk until we get to that point. So I'll leave it at that, um, and I hope that was helpful. Thanks so much to all of you. Before we get to the questions, I wanted to give Rose um, and Tom a chance to respond to these points made by uh, uh, David and Evelyn, also regarding uh, some clarifications uh, about um, uh, the you know you know, you know sitting and and and, and discussing uh, uh, with the Russians and and, and so sort of the the wisdom. Uh, and potential outcomes of something, that kind of engagement. So uh, Rose and Tom, would you like some brief responses? Uh, and then we can uh, move on to some Q&A. Well, I'll just make a couple quick comments. First, I'm delighted that uh, our two interlocutors on the other side of the debate also are uh, keen proponents of diplomacy. And uh, David, I have to say, there is nothing about your stop signs that I can take any issue with. I agree with everything you have to say there. So. I hope that no one listening to this debate will mistake our interest in further uh, and richer uh, discussion with the Russians as being a, uh, 
a sign of somehow uh, not living up to our values, for example, or not supporting our values. So um, I would say, and I'm gonna reflect on my experience uh, at NATO for just a moment. I was responsible for convening the uh, NATO Russia Council for getting the Russians to come to the table and it was a constant struggle but we did use that venue at the venue per se, which was a formal venue, the North Atlantic Council with all the ambassadors around the table to deliver tough mes messages to Russia on as regular a basis as we could uh, at a maximum of about three occasions a year, but always with Ukraine front and center as top priority in our discussions and also uh, talking about Georgia and, and indeed the Bucharest summit uh, priority set for NATO membership, which include Ukraine and Georgia, and there was never any question of that raised. I wanted to talk about the process though. And here's where I think things have fallen off in recent years, the process of diplomacy. There are of course high level summits, there are discussions going on. I'm very glad that Special Envoy Marshal Billingsley has been talking to Deputy Foreign Minister Ribkoff, but it's in the interstices, it's in the constant day-to-day -day interaction that you get the tough messages across. And I felt uh, that I was able at NATO to deliver some very strong messages to the Russian side about their misbehavior in Baltic airspace and to talk to them about the way they were flying their aircraft there. Now, did I get great results? Did they stop? No, but at least I was a voice and I hope a strong voice along with a number of other voices coming at them to say that they needed to cut it out in the Baltic. And that's the kind of pressure I think we need to keep up. And that's, I think that that nuance of, you know, the formal diplomacy, yes, going in and doing the demarches and so forth. What I'm talking about is the day-to-day -day slog to get the red lines carefully picked out, to get the tough messages across and to constantly be telling them that they need to cut it out. Great, Tom? Yeah, I don't have much to, to add to, to what Rose has already said. Uh, you know, I agree that uh, there's very little that we would uh, disagree with in David's description of Russia uh, or the challenges uh, that we face. I, this is something that's constant. Uh, I think it's been uh, a longstanding problem that we've had in our relations with Russia, and it's not merely a, uh, a manifestation of, uh, of current difficulties. Uh, the point I would make on diplomacy, and here I may disagree a little bit with Rose as well with them, uh, David and Evelyn, uh, you know, I think if you're going to have um, an impact on the Russians, you have to have a sustained dialogue at the highest levels um, where you bring together all the, the various issues uh, that are on the agenda in U.S.-Russian relations, uh, that you're not likely to get uh, results or make any uh, progress in, in changing Russian behavior if you talk to them episodically about specific issues in isolation from one another. Um, so what has been missing, I think, over the past uh, three years is that top level uh, conversation. Yes, we've talked about Ukraine. Yes, we've talked about Iran. We've talked about Afghanistan. We've talked about a number of other issues, uh, but we've never had a, a sustained dialogue where an authoritative figure on the American side uh, talks to a responsible figure on the Russian side about that full range of uh, of relations. John Bolton tried to do that. Uh, he didn't survive long enough to have um, another round of that. But I think that's an important element uh, so that the, the Russians hear what our concerns are, uh, how they're related to one another, uh, and what the expectations are on our side uh, along this range of issues uh, that would lead to a, uh, an improved relationship between our two countries. I think that's what has uh, been missing. Final point I would make uh, is that uh, we're not talking about a reset. We're not talking about detente uh, either. We're simply talking about managing what is a very dangerous relationship in a responsible fashion uh, so that we avoid the escalation to a conflict that neither side wants at this point. And we're talking about conducting the relationship in a way uh, that leaves open the possibility for cooperation on a range of issues. Now, we've talked about possible cooperation, or at least working together, uh, certainly in the nuclear realm, uh, perhaps climate change. Uh, but I think much of the cooperation uh, that I envision uh, in this relationship is really cooperation about how we're going to manage a competitive relationship better. Um, so this is not a, a dialogue in order to become partners 
Uh, it's a dialogue uh, between competitors uh, trying to come to some sort of uh, agreement on how to conduct a competitive relationship in ways uh, that does not become uh, overly dangerous to either side. Tom, thanks very much. And I just want to give David and Evelyn the chance for a brief uh, reply to your uh, responses. Um, and especially your proposal, Tom, um, about the logic and merit of having ongoing multi-issue engagement and dialogue um, as a way of managing um, even a competitive uh, uh, relationship. So uh, David and Evelyn be interested in your reactions to Tom and Rose's responses, and then we'll open it up for cues. So I, I, my main response will be brief. It's, uh, we have ambassadors in both countries. The Russian embassy is full of spies. Their, their main mission is to try to recruit people to spy on what we're doing. I don't view the Russian embassy's role as actually trying to facilitate constructive dialogue. I think our embassy does try to facilitate constructive dialogue, but it's also busy chasing after problems, including trying to visit American citizens who have been unfairly detained and are sent off to uh, far off places where they are imprisoned. I, I don't really see where there is a lack of dialogue. Um, Russians, as, as all of us know, love to sit down and talk about these things. They never like to reach results because when results come, then the process ends. So I, I, I'm not sure what good it will do to sit down and talk with them and tell them, um, stop interfering in our elections. And they say, we're not interfering in our elections. We say to them, get out of Ukraine. They say, we're not in Ukraine. Um, stop engaging in, in war crimes in Syria. We're not doing that. I, I fear it that, that the problem is not lack of dialogue. It's not lack of talking to each other. It's that we just have to agree to disagree. It, it reminds me, and I'm going to screw this title up. I, I should have looked it up before. But um, it reminds me of the title of the movie, uh, either he or she is just not that into you. Um, and they're just not that into it us. A book, first. a book, all right. Um, <laughs> and they're just not that into working out problems with us. Thanks. Well, I think, look, I just had two thoughts. Um, you know, one was Tom talks about sustained dialogue at the highest levels, but that means sustained dialogue involving our president and secretary of state. I mean, they don't have time to conduct sustained dialogue, especially if it's going to be fruitless. So I'm just not sure how pragmatic that, <laughs> that, that, that proposal is. Um, and I don't know how those two people necessarily make the outcome that much different from the Russian perspective. The Russians, yes, they might be more favorably inclined because they like the attention and the respect that it shows. And it is important to show the Russians sufficient respect to leave that door open for you know, some kind of deals with them in the future. That is important. Um, but I don't think that sustained dialogue is worth it at the president and secretary of state level, given the fact that we are so at loggerheads with the Russians right now on core issues. And that gets to the second point I had, which was again, you know, Tom said he wants to cooperate on how to manage the relationship. But again, how can you cooperate? What is this detente or this arrangement when our objectives are so at odds? You know, we already have the compromise on the ground, which is frozen conflicts, more or less, although they're not frozen, you know, in Ukraine, in Moldova, in, in, um, in, Azerbaijan, <laughs> again, I'm not, not, not frozen, but that's, I guess, the compromise. We've let the Russians exert influence and, you know, do it counter to international law and order. So um, I still think that while I understand where Rose and Tom are coming from, it's, it's still based on what David and I also wish for, but I don't see how practically, I don't see practically what they're proposing. Okay, great. So let's start moving to the Q&A portion. We have a healthy number of questions, but keep posing them. Uh, Josh, we'll go to you for the first uh, couple of questions. Great. Thanks, Alex. Um, and I want to thank all of our panelists for getting this conversation off going in a super interesting discussion so far and also in the spirit of mutual 
uh, respect is really nice to see in a debate in the United States right now. And I will also note as someone who also studies political polarization in the US, just how interesting it is that we've managed to convene a debate here where we have someone from a Democratic and a Republican administration on both sides of the debate here. So I think there's something hopeful for America in this yeah. that's going on here uh, today. Um, my question for you, I wanna sort of push um, there's lots of threads that have been raised that will get picked up by the Q&A that we have for our audience, but I want to sort of push you in a, in, another, in a slightly different direction here, which is to say, at this point in time, right, you guys have all been at this for many, many years with this group, with, with dealing with Russia in the post-communist era. How much of Russia, when we think of it from the point of view of U.S. foreign policy, is Putin, right? So how much does any approach to U.S.-Russian relations depend on Putin? So is there a Russia policy that's not a Putin policy? So to put this a couple of different ways, does everything change if Putin leaves office? Or is this about a system that has grown up in the post-communist era, in the post-Yeltsin era of Russia? Is there, can we speak of a post-Yeltsin system that will survive Putin? Or even put a different way, does anyone else matter for US diplomatic efforts? Right, so David, you reeled off a litany of things. You started off your thing, a litany of things that the Russian regime had done that we can all be you know, very upset about and agree that has put all sorts of thorns in the relationship with US, um, with US Russian relations. But as people who study domestic politics, we often think about like different components of the state, right? And there's, you know, one of the biggest, most interesting things as someone who's worked on Russian domestic politics is, is this, this tension between Russia as a unitary actor, as we like to sort of talk about Russia and foreign policy, and then people who study the intricacies of what's going on in domestic politics. And, and so is this a case, are there factions within, within the Russian state that actually matter at this point? Are there diplomatic outreaches that can be about empowering different actors within the Russian state, talking to different actors, you know, having, having you know, conversations with different people who have different perspectives. Surely there is disagreement among the people after Putin and what should be doing, or are we just at a point in Russia where nothing else really matters besides it being Putin? And then finally, I wanna just bring this all the way back to the point, I forget who made it earlier about, I think it was David, it was David as well, about the, the, the views of the Russian population towards the United States versus the views of Putin towards the United States. So my final piece of this question is like, does, you know, so maybe there are other actors within the Russian state that matter, uh, different parts of the Russian state institution that matter, or, but what about the mass, mass population? Like, does that matter at all? Does it matter for US foreign policy towards Russia if 40% of Russia sees the US as an, as an, as an adversary or 80% of the Russian population sees the US as an adversary if it's all about Putin? So a lot of things to jump into and I'd love to hear from, from everybody about this kind of big picture way of thinking about what US foreign policy towards Russia vis-a-vis -vis Putin versus Russia is going forward or at this moment. Let's start to order the panelists and then we can reverse it uh, at a later time. So uh, Rose and Tom, would you like to take on the Putin question? Well, I, actually, uh, I wanted to answer the second part of the question. So I, uh, if those who would like to wrestle with the Putin question, then I'll come back to the second, second question. Go, go ahead and answer the second one. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and answer the second yeah. question. All right. Well, I'm chuckling here because, and Tom knows this, I don't know if I've had a chance to talk to David about it, but normative, pragmatist, who knows? I'm a practitioner and I always have been. I've never been particularly a theoretician of these matters. So, uh, but I, I grew up and some of you will remember these, uh, these USIA uh, cultural exchange exhibits. So I'm one of the so-called guide mafia. And I was on an exhibit called Photography USA, Fotografia Shah in 1976, our bicentennial year. We had strategic patience in those days, David, we knew or we thought we knew that the Soviet regime was in it for the real long haul, but we still had these cultural exchanges year in, year out. We sent 22 year olds over to places. I was in Almaty, I was in Kiev, I was way out in the hinterlands. I'd have Kolhoznik's coming up to me and saying, I've never seen an American before. And I spoke Russian, you know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day and talked to them about the price of bread in the United States and how big my apartment was, all that kind of stuff. So I don't know, you know, what kind of dialogue to have? Yes, we need people to people exchanges. I think we need to get back to that. I don't think we'll ever reconstruct those USIA exchange exhibits, but 
but we need to be thinking about, again, about some, I think some pragmatic ways, but also some, uh, some uh, imaginative ways to get people over here. I really loved the program uh, a decade ago, and I don't know if it exists anymore to get young Russians here to the United States to work on summer jobs. Uh, I thought that was a great way to begin to introduce them to America. Some of them had bad experiences, I know, but a great number of them had good experiences. So yes, uh, in answer to many questioners who have asked about people to people exchanges, I'm a big supporter of them. And I do think we need to be imaginative just in the hope that we are seeding, and I, and I do think we need to have st strategic patience here, that we are, are seeding a better kind of environment between the United States and the Russian Federation, regardless of who is sitting in the, in the Kremlin. Um, same to you on Putin. And also, just for the other panelists addressing this, I'll include a question from Golfo Alexopoulos. Uh, should the U.S. engage with the Russian opposition? What are the advantages and costs of doing so, as you formulate? Okay, so uh, Alex, that's a, a big question, um, uh, and let me try to answer it uh, as uh, as briefly as possible. Uh, first, on the question of whether this is all about Putin, I think the short answer is no. Uh, I've argued before uh, that Putin does represent uh, a long tradition in Russian foreign policy thinking uh, about what uh, defines Russia as a great power, how Russia needs to position itself. Uh, in the world in order to be a great power. Uh, one of those uh, is uh, being the preeminent power in what is now the former Soviet space uh, in one fashion or another. Uh, I don't think this is uh, unique to Putin. Uh, in fact, if you, um, if you listen to what Navalny has said, perhaps the, the leading and most prominent opposition figure today, uh, he's certainly not about re uh, to return Crimea to Ukraine uh, as a matter of, of policy. Uh, Navalny has certain nationalistic elements. Uh, one of the reasons that he has been looked askance at from um, some of the more uh, liberal or what we would call pro-Western uh, uh, opposition figures in Moscow itself. Um, I think, uh, you know, having a uh, relationship with Europe uh, that is based largely on bilateral ties as opposed to the European Union is something uh, that you would find support across the, the Russian p political spectrum. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, in a post-Putin Russia, uh, that you'll find that a lot of the drivers of Russia's foreign policy, its national interest, are perceived in the same way. Now, there'll be stylistic differences. Um, you know, not everybody's going to be Putin riding bare chest on a horse and fishing and whatever else he's, uh, he's done. Uh, Russia may find that it's overstretched and retrenched uh, in some way. But I think there's a fundamental set of attitudes about how Russia positions itself uh, in the outside world that will continue to drive Russian foreign policy. Uh, and they are attitudes that in many ways run counter to our own. So there's always going to be a level of competition. Second point, there are different factions uh, in Russia with very different approaches to how you, how you deal uh, with the advance of these national interests. And we need to be aware of them uh, we should uh, access as many of those as, uh, as we possibly can. Now, uh, there is a technocratic group, uh, of, uh, particularly on the economic side, that is fairly easy for us to access. Uh, the people who have a significant amount of uh, power and influence in Russia today, this seem to be key, the power ministries, special services, the military, uh, are much harder for us to access. Um, and in fact, uh, we can have access to them only through formal channels. Again, I think one of the reasons why uh, we need diplomatic dialogue. Final question on the people. Um, you know, Russia is not a democracy. Um, the people and popular opinion doesn't uh, count for as much in Russian national foreign policy as it would in the United States. You can't conduct the sustained foreign policy in the United States without popular support. Um, that's in part what this upcoming election is about. In Russia, it's possible to do that. Um, you know, that said, uh, you know, I think David may be right that, uh, and that polls would suggest the Russian people as a whole do not see the United States as an enemy. Uh, but the Russian population was certainly wildly supportive of what, uh, what Putin did in Crimea in 2014. Uh, they were wildly supportive of what uh, Putin did in Syria in 2015. So I, again, I think um, how you uh, weigh in popular support uh, 
is problematic at this point. Bottom line is, it's the people in the Kremlin that decide Russian foreign policy. Those are the people we have to deal with in the first instance. You need to keep in mind these other aspects uh, and see how you may be able to use those to advance your position, but you're going to be dealing first and foremost uh, with Putin and his colleagues. Um, on the Putin versus Russia uh, distinction. Yeah, I, first, uh, just on Rose's point about people to people exchanges, I, I don't think any of us on this uh, Zoom chat are opponents of that. I think the obstacles have been thrown in on the Russian side. Uh, they have been the ones that have caused complications and continuation of these programs, not, not the US side. On the issue of Putin versus Russia, um, I, and Tom and I have had this debate before, I do think there is a distinction between what Putin is pursuing, which are things in his interest versus what should be in Russia's national interest. I don't imagine that it's in Russia's national interest to have countries along its borders become increasingly anti-Russian and more interested in pursuing your Atlantic integration. Thanks to Putin's invasion of Ukraine and the illegal annexation of Crimea, um, Ukrainians now, by a slight majority, support joining NATO. That was not the case before 2014. Georgia remains a strongly pro-Western, pro-American country, eager to join your Atlantic institutions. The, 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 the Kremlin risks turning the people of Belarus against Russia if they continue to be seen as propping up Lukashenko. These are, are issues that are of interest to Putin because he doesn't like to see regime change driven by popular movements. He doesn't see, like to see like-minded leaders fall from power, hence his intervention in Syria, which I think the Russian population is slowly getting tired of and, and body bags coming home. Um, I think the same, by the way, might happen in Libya, where there seems to have been a, a privatization of Russian policy in Libya to allow the Wagner group with Prigozhin uh, to do that. Um, and, and so we see increasingly see a corrupting and a personalization of Russian foreign policy that is driven by what Putin thinks is in his best interest, even if it doesn't square with what's in Russia's national interest. Just to add to that, I mean, I think obviously the structure of the Russian government and the way it operates and the people both matter. Um, but in this case, we have Putin and his cronies who want to maintain an autocratic, kleptocratic system. And so as long as we have Putin or someone of his ilk in power, this is unfortunately, for the moment at least, the foreign policy that we can expect. Although we can continue to have dialogue with them to wait for the moment when it could potentially change. Um, having said that, you know, if we look at the opposition, um, there are people there who would like to have a less confrontational approach to the world and to have true national interests of Russia at hand, first and foremost economics. So they wanna tear down that kleptocracy, but they also want greater democracy. Um, I had the opportunity actually to be on a podcast with Vladimir Milov, who's an economic advisor to Alexei Navalny. Um, and this was literally the week before last, I think, I don't know all the weeks get smushed together these days. Um, and you can find it on the Institute for Current World Affairs. So icwa.org or you put in Milov and Farkas and you'll find it. Um, and in that um, podcast, Vladimir said something and I wanna just mention it because I've seen sanctions get raised in some of the questions. He said, um, he wants us to continue to sanction Russia, to continue to have a firm line against Russia. And he's so grateful to and he and the opposition members are grateful to Angela Merkel, the, Rus the German chancellor, for speaking out firmly and very clearly saying that it was the Kremlin that poisoned Alexei Navalny and calling them to explain them, calling for them to explain themselves. So I think the opposition does want us to continue to be firm. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, I think I'll just stop there. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks so much, Evelyn and David. Thanks all for your answer to the question. Um, we're going to start asking some questions from the audience. And given that we have about a half an hour left, I think we're going to slightly change the format here. We're going to pose questions to each of you individually that have come in from audience members. It's kind of our guess who to pose them to. So if you really want to jump in on, on something somebody else says, feel free to do that. Uh, so David, I want to pose to you, Carol, a question from Carol Savitz, who is asking, how much do you think the difference between the two groups is based on uh, differing assessments of the Putin of Putin's of the strength of Putin's regime. So, how much of it is is addressed from seeing 
the Putin regime is sort of fundamentally less strong than maybe it gets credit for in the in the in the global environment, or conversely, from thinking it's actually uh, a stronger you know stronger regime, and that and Putin is serious about kind of continuing this quest for great power status and has the ability to go about doing it. So, how much is the difference based on a conceptualization of the relative strength of the Putin regime vis-a-vis -vis its own population? Uh, thanks, Josh, and, and thanks to Carol for the question. A former professor of mine, she probably doesn't want to be reminded of that, but uh, she was my professor too when I was in. There you go. So she yeah. obviously did something right, uh, at least in your case. I don't know. That jury's still out with me. Um, look, I, I think that you know Tom was saying that it's not all about Putin. Um, I I wish I could agree with that. I I think Putin is the decider in chief, if you will, um, and. Not that he uh, offers explicit orders on things to do, but he creates an environment. So for example, with the, the shooting uh, and, and brutal murder of Boris Nemtsov in 2015 or the poisoning of Alexei Navalny uh, earlier this year, I could imagine that Putin didn't give explicit orders, but Putin has created and now enabled an environment in which people who work with him or for him um, believe that these kinds of actions will ingratiate themselves to Putin. And it creates an incredibly dangerous environment. Putin could put a stop to that. He could investigate those responsible for these kinds of things. He chooses not to do so because the, the threat of those investigations may lead back to him. So I, I think there, there is a lot to be said that a lot of the, uh, uh, well, the litany that I ran through at the beginning is because of decisions Putin has made, maybe not based on the best information because I imagine uh, people in the intelligence services and in the Kremlin don't like to present him with uh, thinking that runs counter to, to his own thinking. Sounds a little familiar here. Um, and so I, I, do, I do think that Putin bears responsibility for most, if not all, of the bad things that happen, even if he is not explicitly uh, given orders to do so. Okay, thanks, David. Um, Evelyn, turning to you, uh, we got a question, question from Christopher Leisure, I hope um, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, should Biden win the election? How do you think this would influence re relations with Russia over the next four years? So we were going to get to this point eventually, obviously, in this discussion. I'll throw it first to Evelyn, anyone else who wants to chime in on this as well. But like, how much is everything that you, the snapshot you got, these two sides have given us in the summer of 2020, how much is that hinging on what happens in the current election? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, I can't speak for the vice president. I don't speak for him. I did work with him, including cl closely with him and staff him even on meetings with um, people like uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov. But, um, and I'm, I'm sure Rose has as well. Um, but what I can say is that we will have a clear policy because the four of us agree that right now we do not have a clear concerted policy. We have, we have a policy that's pretty much the Obama era policy up to the cabinet level, although there's some wavering there as well. And then definitely at the presidential level, you know, a contradiction of that policy. So, so um, now in the tension, the overall policy has more or less held, although there's been a price um, in lives. And, you know, when I look at the Middle East, for example, um, when I look at attempted assassinations, um, and certainly in opportunity, in cost. Um, but ultimately, if we have a Biden administration, there will be a clear policy. I believe it will resemble something more like what I guess I would support, which is being firm, calling the Russians out for all of their infractions and their continued breaking of international law but holding dialogue as we always have with the Russians on arms control and other issues, maintaining the door open to cooperation as we did during the Obama administration. So it would be more akin to the Obama administration, but, but, less, but less willing to, um, how should I say it? Uh, less willing to be blunt because I think where Joe Biden is different is he is willing to just you know, call a spade a spade. Um, so, so that is, I think, what we would see. And I think that Biden would really strive to improve the relationship, 
including through people to people and other more creative options so that we can get beyond it because it's really a waste of everyone's time. It's a waste of the Russian people's time. It's a waste of our time. You know, we need to be dealing with the urgent and the existential, which is the climate crisis. There's nothing more important than that. And then we also have this issue with China you know, asserting itself in the Asia Pacific and elsewhere. And we need to, ideally, we need to work together with all of Europe, as well as Russia, um, to make sure that the Chinese stay also within the international um, institutions and the bounds of international law. Great, thank you. So our next posed question, we'll go to Rose, and this is from Tinatin Japaritse, um, who uh, uh, is, has a question about extending the new start. Uh, she says, uh, with less than four months left until the treaty expires and the U.S. and Russia seemingly not on the same page from recent news reports, uh, what message would you like to relay to allies who are worried about the agreement's fate? In your opinion, is the NST doomed or are you hopeful that an extension may be reached? Well, we've actually had some uh, fairly vigorous diplomacy over the summer, and I do want to underscore and for my colleagues just to underscore that there has been regular high level contact between Trump and Putin throughout the summer. They've had eight telephone calls, uh, which seem from media reports to have been focused on trying to find some kind of deal uh, on nuclear arms control. Again, I mentioned earlier, I welcome the role that Marshall Billingsley has been playing with his counterpart, uh, Sergei Ribkov, and I, I welcome the fact that the president's have been engaged at this high level. So I, I just wanted to say we have been engaging at high levels, at least in this area. And I think that that is a good thing. Over the weekend, it became clear that they have, uh, they've reached a stopping point in the negotiations. I'm not sure at this moment that uh, it uh, will be possible now. I was quite optimistic that they could reach a deal which would extend New START for some period of time. Uh, Putin agreed to a one-year extension uh, the US side was arguing for a one year extension plus a freeze on warheads and also leaving the door open to bringing China to the table in future. But uh, it seems that Putin was willing to give on the one year extension, but he was not willing to yet give on the other two items. And so the negotiations may now be at a stopping point, but I will say that I feel rather more optimistic uh, than I had before because before there had been constant, uh, you know, uh, and a take it or leave it from, from the Trump administration to the Russian side and a sense that perhaps a new start would, uh, would be on the chopping block, but I don't sense that that's quite the same now. It seems to be very much part uh, of the negotiation and a necessary part of the negotiation. So I'm quite hopeful uh, that new start will be extended either uh, by the Trump administration or should Vice President Biden be elected president, it's already clear from the party platform and from statements uh, of the campaign that they are willing to extend New START. So I think we can get it done. Just for those of you who are not familiar with the technical aspect of the extension, the treaty is written very simply. In order to extend the treaty, I, in order to extend the treaty, uh, you only have to uh, exchange diplomatic notes. It doesn't have to be re-ratified. It doesn't have to go back to the Senate. It's possible to do it very, very simply and quickly. Nevertheless, should uh, Biden enter into office, there will only be two weeks for it to be done if President Trump does not himself extend it. So we will have to, I think, pay attention to the matter uh, as a new president enters office. But nevertheless, bottom line is I feel rather more optimistic than I had been in the past. Uh, thanks. Thanks very much for that. Uh, next, I'd like to go to Tom with Peter Clement's uh, question. Once the US election is over, should the winner set up an interagency group to determine whether to engage Russia more than the US does now? And if so, in which areas? And is there any chance Congress would be receptive to any efforts to re-engage Russia examination of US policy, and I would just sort of editorialize on this, not Peter, this is me, especially on the Democratic side, where Russia is viewed as much as a domestic actor um, as it is a foreign policy uh, challenge. Thanks. Uh, good, good question, Alex. Um, <clears throat> let me start by saying, um, you know, part of the problem we've had in dealing with Russia is that it's become a domestic political issue, uh, and in many ways, not a foreign policy issue anymore. 
Um, I would hope that once we get past the election, um, <clears throat> that uh, we will be able to devote more attention to Russia as a foreign policy problem. And I think the chances of that happening uh, are greater if there's a clear result uh, on uh, November 3rd or whatever uh, sort of period after that we need to, to count all the ballots. <clears throat> you know, that said, um, you know, if Biden uh, were to win, I think it does make sense to send up an interagency. One of the things that has been lacking uh, in this administration, um, you know, it's not only for Russia, uh, the Biden administration uh, should do what, uh, you know, every American uh, president has done uh, over the past uh, 40 or 50 years, with the possible exception of Trump, and that has set up a uh, a well-defined interagency process uh, so that you can ensure that uh, policy issues are properly vetted, uh, that you reach some sort of common ground within the administration and how you're going to pursue it. Uh, and each element uh, in the government then uh, carries out uh, its part of the, uh, the policy consistent with what the others are doing, as opposed to what we have now where uh, individual agencies in many cases, pursue their own uh, Russia policy uh, without reference to what others are doing. Um, you know, I think that's important. That's a, a clear element uh, or a, a, a key need in developing coherent Russian uh, policy. Uh, as I said, I think the engagement ought to be broad. Uh, I think the, the next administration ought to designate a senior official who's going to manage this relationship. Uh, it can either be a special representative, it can be a, uh, a senior official occupying another position, but there needs to be someone uh, who oversees uh, and is the primary point of contact uh, with the Russian side, who can provide an authoritative statement uh, to the Russians of what US policy is across the full range of issues uh, on the US-Russia uh, agenda. So I hope that the, the, the Biden administration would do something along those lines. Uh, the final element here that I've already suggested is uh, that once the administration decides on a policy, uh, it does make it does need to make a concerted effort uh, to present that policy to the public, uh, to the Congress. We can't pursue any effective policy with Russia without uh, without uh, public support and without congressional support. I think in a Biden administration that does all these steps uh, can bring along the Congress. Uh, to, to back it or at least provide the type of support it needs uh, to pursue uh, whatever policy it decides on, uh, at least during the first, uh, the first year or two of an administration. Thanks, Tom. Um, Evelyn, you mentioned briefly earlier the environment uh, as, as, as a sort of pressing issue. We've gotten a couple of questions. One, uh, that came in from Eric Lohr about the environment directly. Another that came in from Paul Carter, just asking more generally beyond arms control, what are some of the issues on which, you know, if we were gonna have a any other issue besides arms control on which there could be points of, of fruitful contact, uh, even in the more kind of limited, uh, the framework that you and David have proposed, uh, is the environment on that list? If it's not on that list, you know, if it is on that list, how do you foresee that this might be able to work? If it's not on that list, are there other areas uh, that you can think of that might be next up besides the environment? So the environment might be an area where the Russian government decides it's in their interest to work with the United States and within the bounds of international law and maybe even through international institutions in order to achieve what it deems in its national security interests. So that is an area where I think we should keep the door open and keep trying with the Russians. We do see that there's that's an area also where we have consistently treated them as equals um, and vice versa, I, I would argue. Um, when the forest fires uh, ranged, raged in Russia in 2015, we offered assistance and they took it. Um, later, they were more reticent. They offered us then assistance, which got a little politicized, obviously, um, in the pandemic. But I think the idea of humanitarian um, assistance and then um, Science is science, and I and I do think you know, regardless of what you know, very detrimental impact the Russian regime has had on its society, they still have a very strong base of energized scientists, and so I think we should continue to try 
to work um, and maybe be more creative and see if we can come up with something new with the Russians. But again, not compromising on other issues. Great, thanks so much, Evelyn. Um, next question, we got a question from Ted Gerber who's asked about, um, so it's sort of following on the people to people contact, but thinking about um, Rose, as you noted in your, in, your, in your comment to the whole, in the chat to all of the attendees, that obviously we're in a very different situation where we don't need to you know, explain how that there is bread for sale in the United States at supermarkets when Russians can turn on and watch the Americans on YouTube if they want to, you know, and get all of, you know, all of these different, um, with the social media era they're in. But we're in this kind of like weird asymmetry here where Russia is clearly trying to at least, that's a whole other question whether it's effective, use social media in a way to um, engage, at least at the very least, engage in uh, swaying opinion within the United States. Um, but social media, of course, you know, it's about networks, it's about connecting people, and it's a way that you can connect people. And you could imagine it as a 21st century equivalent of people to people connections. And we have interesting grad, grad students who do interesting projects on trying to get people discussing, you know, discussing things cross-culturally online. So I wonder if either of you, uh, Rose or David, could comment on this. And then we've got another question for whichever one doesn't answer this question. Uh, on, on this question of the role of social media, the asymmetry in social media with it, it essentially being weaponized against the, by the Russians against the United States in the sort of most, maybe most egregious um, acts around the 2016 elections. Um, is there a role for social media as, as in part of this kind of 21st century person to person type contact uh, out there? So we'd be interested in hearing a bit about that. Well, maybe I'll start uh, very quickly again, reflecting on my NATO experience. I think nobody's perfect at this yet. The Russians have a head start, I think, in terms of weaponizing social media and, and they've used it egregiously. But in the NATO context, uh, we had several examples of being able to push back very effectively and NATO's made it their business to figure out how to do this. For example, in our exercise two years ago, Trident Juncture 2018, we used a lot of social media directed at Russia, you know, just with normal NATO soldiers from all over the place. There was, uh, there was one hunky soldier from Norway who was repeatedly, you know, on our, our uh, Twitter feed and so forth, doing, doing little interviews about and talking to various soldiers about, you know, what this exercise was and what it wasn't. And I think that was an effective way to really push messages uh, into Russia. We've also in NATO used it to push back, for example, this egregious case in Lithuania a couple of years ago when they repeated their uh, effort with, with the Lisa story in Germany, where they attracted a lot of attention from, uh, from Russian speaking new German citizens by saying that a, uh, a migrant from the Muslim world had raped a Russian you know, young girl named Lisa in Germany. And it created this huge brouhaha. And then it turned out that it was a fake. A couple, a year later, they tried the same in Lithuania saying that a German a soldier uh, had raped a young Lithuanian girl. And immediately the Lithuanian media and the government were very savvy. They said, oh, this has hints of the Lisa affair. Let's look into this. And they dug down deep and they immediately began to push back. And the Lithuanian media, really, really joined in that effort. So I think we are not without tools. We just need to be paying more attention. We need to be savvier. I commend the work of the uh, Center of Excellence in Latvia, NATO Center of Excellence that is doing a lot of this work on STRATCOM, uh, really, really trying hard um, to, to work these issues. The only thing I'll say on the other question is, I really think that we do have some more assets now. I'm finding through these Zoom you know, methodologies and other kinds of video, I, I'm sure your graduate students are taking advantage of them as well. It's much easier to communicate regularly with Russians, with Russian academics. I liked what Evelyn had to say about the scientist to scientist engagement. I hope we can do more of it, but it's, it's facilitated now uh, by more of these, uh, these remote, remote video conferencing uh, capabilities we have. And uh, I'm sorry, very sorry about the pandemic that's ravaging countries around the world, but there has been this, I think, beneficial side effect. Great. No, I mean, and, and we're having this event at 12 o'clock. We used to have these events at five o'clock. The reason we have them at 12 is because we've noticed at the Jordan Center, we get you know large numbers of Russians now coming to our academic events. And so we've shifted them all to, be, to earlier in the day so that we can have people in Russia attending just as well. So 
Alex, you want to ask the next one? Yeah, uh, let's go to David. David, we'd also be interested in any thoughts you might have about the social media weaponization question. But also, um, there's a question from Elizabeth Valconier, um, who says, how helpful is the extension of NATO presence in Poland to improving U.S.-Russian relations? And as a proponent of NATO expansion, David, how do you view uh, the Eastern expansion and the role that it's played um, in U.S. security policy and in U.S.-Russia relations? Thanks, Alex. Yeah, I'll, I'll let Evelyn maybe address the social media since I'm not on social media and she's been the target of it. Uh, I may be the target, but I don't know. Although I will just say, I got as we were on here, um, the, I got a headline from the Washington Post, U.S. charges Russian intelligence officers cyber attacks targeting foreign elections, the Olympics, and key American allies. Um, so there we are. So we, you know, it is still in full bloom. Um, on NATO enlargement, I, I think if you asked a, a, an Estonian, a, a Latvian, or a Lithuanian, uh, they would say, thank God for NATO enlargement. They, are, they sleep better at night knowing that they have the safety provided by Article 5 security guarantees. Otherwise, they might have faced the same fate that uh, Ukraine has faced, that Georgia has faced, um, Moldova in a different respect, and, and what Belarus is, is facing, albeit not complete overt military intervention, but certainly uh, intervention through Russian security forces and Russian TV presenters. I won't call them journalists because people who work for RT and Sputnik aren't journalists. They're propagandists, dangerous ones at that. Um, and so I think NATO should keep the door open to aspiring countries. I know um, Tom and I, again, have had this debate about <laughs> NATO enlargement when it comes to Ukraine and Georgia. Jo Tom wants to take it off the table. I actually want the Ukrainians and Georgians to be at that table when the discussion takes place. Um, and I don't want to make decisions above them without them. Um, and none of these countries would be seeking to join if Putin wasn't posing a threat to them. That's the bottom line. Um, now, granted, the, some of these aspired to join before Putin came to power. Uh, but the uncertainty of Russia in the 1990s did not allay their concerns. The certainty that comes with Putin in Russia today um, heightens their concerns and desire to join. Okay, thanks so much, David. Um, I'm gonna now uh, pose a final question to all of the panelists as we're getting close to 1.30. And so we had a, um, we've had a number of questions along these lines, including um, from uh, Vlad Lupan, who's the ex-Moldovan ambassador to the UN, who's on the call as well. Um, and also we've gotten a similar question uh, as well from uh, Ed Schatz. And I'm gonna sort of bundle these together, which is to say, so we've had a very uh, productive and civil conversation across the two different letters here today. Um, and you want to ruin that now? No, no, no. I don't want to ruin that. Oh, all right. Okay. The question that we want to ask here is we're getting, we're getting a number of questions in these. We won't let you. Right. Is can't you, you know, is there a way to combine the normative and the pragmatic approaches here? Are they really, really all that, all that different going forward? And within that context, can you have a kind of, um, a prag, and I guess to just put the needle in a little bit there, uh, can you have a pragmatic approach? that's underlined with this normative level of rejection of, I think like going back to the early lines, rejection of, you know, poisoning Navalny and, and these sorts of things that are, that should, that are the, the, I think the normative side argues, you know, really should be out of bounds and shouldn't be rewarded with business as usual. Can you have the pragmatic side, which is kind of a sense pushing some degree of business as usual, underlined with these strong kind of normative kind of uh, parts to it without Kind of pushing Russia back into a, a pragmatic corner. So into a corner where it feels it's unable to respond in a way that either the pragmatic side or the normative side would do. So is there a way to combine these or are these really just kind of, we got to go one path or the other um, and either it's business as usual without more over moralizing or it's, these are, this is an out of bounds actor who is, you know, fundamentally is, is aimed at threatening our, our regime survival as well trying to undermine democracy and this is not someone who gets normal diplomatic treatment. So you each have, uh, you know, two minutes <laughs> at most to, to square that circle. Uh, Tom, why don't we start with you? Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, I would just make uh, a, a couple of points here. Uh, first, I mean, the issue here really is one of balance. Uh, it's not a, a matter of uh, doing one or the other. 
uh, you can't pursue a, a foreign policy that has the support of the American people that doesn't have a normative element to it. That's who we are as Americans. Uh, and that has been in our foreign policy since the founding of the Republic, as has the pragmatic element. Uh, the question really is how you balance those uh, in current circumstances. Uh, I think that uh, our policy now uh, is overbalanced in the direction of the normative and not pragmatic enough. Uh, and that risks a further deterioration in the relationship that will redound to our, uh, our disadvantage um, on a range of issues, uh, beginning with the, the nuclear issue, uh, but also on uh, a number of geopolitical issues. Uh, on NATO expansion, for example, uh, the issue is not, is, is, the, the pragmatic issue is how far can you push this without getting the Russian response you don't want? Uh, and clearly, uh, when we uh, made the issue, open up the issue of Ukraine and Georgia, uh, we pushed it too far. Uh, we got the response from the Russians that we could have anticipated, and we had no adequate response to that. That, I think, is a failure in policy. Uh, the second point I would want to make is when I'm arguing a pragmatic uh, position, I'm not arguing business as usual. I said this relationship is competitive. Forget all the uh, rhetoric we had about strategic partnership, integration of Russia into the Euro-Atlantic zone, that is not on the table. That's not what we're talking about. We come to this as, as competitors. Uh, the question is, how do you manage this? Uh, and for the United States, how do you manage this in a way that you get incremental advantage over time? Uh, so uh, if there's a competition, uh, I'm still playing to win. Evelyn? I'll go because it's easy because I already answered it before. <laughs> I mean, I basically said that I don't believe in this distinction that was created by Tom between pragmatists and normativists. Um, I believe that we should approach this the way Reagan did probably with our eyes wide open with strong and firm language, but also with strong diplomacy that gets backed up by our firmness across the board, political, economic, military, other measures. So. I believe that it is a question of balancing your risk in order to achieve your objectives. And yeah, I, I'm, I already answered it. Thank you. David, you wrote the response letter. So is this a false dichotomy between the two or are these, you know, are, are these, you know, separate paths that one needs to be prioritized over the other? Well, look, I, I think if we're true to our principles and our values, we are pursuing our interests. Our interests include our values and our principles. And we have a regime in Moscow that is diametrically opposed to those principles and values. And I think we have to recognize that some of our differences, or maybe many of our differences with the current Russian regime are irreconcilable. Um, now we can manage how we, those manifest themselves, but uh, you know, I think if, if we look back, and I got to pick up on Tom's point about NATO enlargement, Russia didn't invade Ukraine because of NATO. NATO had nothing to do with it. Russia invaded Ukraine because the people of Ukraine had enough of the Yanukovych regime, and Yanukovych reversed himself on pursuing agreements with the European Union. There were no agreements being talked about with NATO. In fact, Yanukovych took NATO off the table for Ukraine at that point. Um, in, in the case of 2008 with Georgia, some would argue, and I'm one of them, that we demonstrated a failure for Georgia by not offering MAP. Mo Moscow is so fixated on the three letters uh, MAP that when the Bucharest communique said Ukraine and Georgia will become members of NATO, I actually think Moscow is more focused on MAP and said NATO doesn't really care about Georgia. We can get away with invading the country. And to some extent, and this is a self-criticism of the Bush administration, Russia did get away with the invasion of, of Georgia. And I think that should be a lesson to us that when we let Putin engage in these kinds of actions and this kind of behavior, we only embolden him and lead him to think that he can continue down this path. So we were right to respond with sanctions on Ukraine. They shouldn't be lifted unless and until Putin withdraws from there. And we should respond with, uh, whether it's indictments that I read out just a few minutes ago, or more pushback on a regime that I think poses a, a, a threat to us on a, on a consistent, ongoing basis. This isn't just in the past. This is the present. And it will be the future, I fear, as long as Putin and those like him will stay in power. Thanks, David. Uh, Rose with the last word. And then we'll pass back to Alex. 
as Americans, we have to continually condemn thuggery wherever it occurs in the world, the, the Kremlin or anywhere else in the world. So I think that's first and foremost. I agree with David that currently we have irreconcilable uh, differences with the Putin regime, part of it related to the, to the thuggery that emanates from the Kremlin. So we have to continue to bear that in mind. We did, however, also have uh, irreconcilable differences with the Soviet regime uh, throughout its history and managed to have relations uh, with uh, the Soviet leadership. And so I think reflecting on that history may have some further useful lessons for us. I will end with just the briefest of vignettes from my winter in Almaty in 1976. I was there for the uh, November parade, the revolution parade. It was snowing like heck, very deep snow coming down. Some pensioners were marching along with their, their their placards of Brezhnev and the rest of the Politburo. At some point, they just threw them down in the snow, scrambled over the, the uh, drifts and walked away. I heard one of them saying, enough already. So let's just keep pushing the rock uphill and sooner or later, it'll be enough already. And uh, I do believe that there will be potential for the Russian system to, to change and to evolve and let us hope in the best direction for sound US-Russian policy. Rose, thank you so much for that. And to all the panelists today, uh, to Tom, to David, to Evelyn for joining us. And despite our best efforts to like put you up against each other after this kind of social media full contact pair of letters, um, this has been a model of substance and stability. Thank you again for taking the time. Thank you to the audience for all your questions. Josh will sign off with details about our next event. Great, yeah, let me join and thank the panelists as well. Thanks to the audience for joining us today. Uh, and just to quickly flag, we've got two more New York City Russia public policy events coming up uh, this semester. On November 6th, we will we'll have a, um, what does the election mean for US-Russian relations? We'll be partnering with PONARS, uh, which is run out of George Washington University to get a variety of different perspectives on that topic on November 6th. And we'll see what we know on November 6th as well. Uh, so we're being a little optimistic maybe in scheduling it that quickly to the election. And then on December 8th, we will have an event on the uh, on, on ongoing uh, events on the ground in Belarus and what it means for Russia, Russian foreign policy, Russian domestic politics as well. So we hope to see many of you there uh, as we continue this seminar series throughout the academic year. Thanks all for coming today. Thanks co-host to Alex. Thanks to Harriman Institute. Thanks as well um, to uh, Sasha Spatanek from the Jordan Center who has been uh, marvelously making sure that all of this goes uh, as well. And to uh, Carly Jackson and Alexander Torek from the, uh, Alex Torek from the Harriman Institute. Alex, did I think, forget anyone on the Harriman side. Okay, great. Thanks everybody. It was great to see you. Good to see you. Thanks so Thanks much. Thanks a lot.